This is the uh, July 10th meeting of the Reading Planning Commission. Um, we are rescheduled because of a couple of different uh, scheduling issues in July and August. So this month in July, we're actually having two Reading Planning Commission's meeting tonight and also Tuesday, July 30th, just so everybody knows. Um, and we'll post that in the town hall, the town website, and uh, also put a notice in the front porch forum. And also, it's a busy PC ZBA month. Um, Jane, we have a ZBA hearing next Wednesday, yeah? Yes. At six o'clock? Six o'clock. Okay. The continuation of the Hall Art Foundation conditional mm -hmm. use permit. Yeah. And that's here, right? Yes. No more site visits? No. Okay. Um, so those are the three things happening this month for PCZBA. Thanks to uh, Ray for joining us in person, and thanks to being online. Um, with that, uh, let's call the meeting to order and make introductions. We have the three uh, PC members. We are still seeking two more and two alternates, so spread the word if anyone's interested. Um, we are also joined by Martha, who is our consultant advisor from the Manuscutney Regional Con Commission, and Shanann, who is graciously taking minutes. Thank you, Shanann. Um, any changes to the agenda? Okay. No. Hearing none, I'm going to move on. Um, approval of the minutes from June 3rd. Was there, was there a change to the minutes? I recall. No? Okay. Yeah, wasn't there um, through emails? Somebody yeah. Stacy, did you change the minutes? Make an addition, amendment to the minutes from the last meeting? No, I don't, I don't believe so. And I reviewed them again today. Um, and I didn't have any revisions. Okay. I think okay. what I did um, this past month was sent it out prior to yeah. Oh, and that's what the correction came. Okay. So anything that was corrected would have already been what was submitted. Okay. So um, let's have a motion to approve those minutes and take that as a formal vote. I motion to approve the minutes. Okay. Uh, let's say, Jane, you moved it. I heard that first. And Stacy, if you don't mind seconding, um, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Uh, approval is unanimous. Those can go in the record books. Um, next item is any reports. Uh, I'll take mail and email. We have not gotten any emails that I am aware of, and I have finally figured out how to use our planning commission email and zoning board email. So um, that is actively being monitored by me now. I think. Jane knows how to get in because she's the one who told me. And Stacy, I don't know if you're able to look in that. Great. So we all know how. To, you don't know how to get on. All right. Well, someone is monitoring that. So if you need to get in touch with the Planning Commission or the ZBA, um, we do log on and check that uh, periodically. Um, Excuse me. Um, so just, just for everyone's information, the process, if we do get an email, then you one of you will forward it on to the rest of the commission. If it's of anything of importance. Yes. Okay. Yes. So in theory, we should all be able to log in and monitor that, but I will try to log on periodically. I'm sure Jane does too, as CBA chair. And if there's anything interesting, I know I will be forwarding it to both of you and, and vice versa. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, we have a problem. What's the problem? That the report that she sent me, I sent to myself and I can't find it. Oh, I have it so, printed. Okay. Um, oh, we, yeah, there you go. The only thing we it. did re receive is the next item on the agenda, which is Kathy Rondo's report from the Regional Planning Commission, which is right here. Okay. If you want to read it or summarize it for the group. Uh, I'll read it. Um, we have exciting update to HMGP Hazard Mitigation Grant D4720 funding to pass on to you. 
Please reach out to the MARC planners with any project ideas that reduce long-term future risk, and we'll work with you to develop ideas into a potential application. Eligible activities, implementing hazard mitigation projects and hazard mitigation planning related activities, date announced February 15th, 2024, pre-application deadline August 16th, 2024, where to submit, um, I can put it uh, in the minutes, I'll give it to you, okay. Uh, what to submit, and as of this date of this amendment, Vermont Emergency Management can now cover 100% of the local match. So you can just, yeah, yeah I'll give it to Shannon. <laughs> um, VEM will be accepting pre-application forms on a rolling basis. Uh, encourages to submit the pre-application form as soon as possible to allow time for initial review. Um, the HMGP aims to support mitigation planning and long-term hazard mitigation measures that enhance the state's resilience posture, avoid loss of life, and reduce damages to improved properties. Um, more information is available at a website that will be in our minutes, and it's from Mark. Thank you. So is that something we should be applying for? Martha, is that something we should be applying for? If there's, if there's projects that you need funding for that are related yeah. to, you know, resilience, emergency management, that sort of thing, then, then, yeah. Does that fall under the planning commission's purview or the select board? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> that question. feels like a select board thing to me. Yeah. It does. I mean, Probably. And what's the deadline on that again? August 16th, I think it was. Do they get that as well, do you know? Or does that come just to the Planning Commission? Oh, well, it's from Mark, uh, and it's I can the pass. Regional Planning Commission that reports to the PC. So we can send one on to the um, yeah. select board. Let's send that to the select board. Mm -hmm. I, I personally don't have any projects for uh, hazard mitigation, but maybe they do. Yeah. Um, just make a note of that. And then if you apply for that grant, I don't know if you know this, Martha, what's the likelihood of getting one? Don't know that either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Depends on how well, many Well, thanks for that information. Yeah. How many people <laughs> apply, you know. And okay. I know we're trying to get people to apply because it's rare that you have no match. Yeah. yeah. You know, you get all the funding. Okay. GMHA got one for $100,000. Oh, wow. So what are you mitigating? The uh, flood hazards to keep wiping out our rings um, and right. the D-bar and the bridges. Um, so they've got a plan that they proposed to um, hopefully resolve that. And when we got the grant, we got a $100,000 grant. Excellent. Yeah. So how did you find out about it? I'm still, I'm not on the board anymore, but I'm still active. So how are they going to mitigate that? Do you know? There's, uh, there's, there's a couple of gating factors. Um, one, one is, uh, Pritam Singh is going to sell the field that is adjacent to GMHA, that GMHA has been using for 40 plus years for the jump field and for um, several of the uh, other events. And he offered it first to GMHA uh, for $2 million. And if GMHA doesn't buy it, he's going to give it to, up to a developer. So yeah, it really puts GMHA in a box. I mean, that, that field is key to, mm -hmm. to having the entire course available and so on and so forth. So, so if that all goes through, um, we're going to uh, somehow do some sort of a, a, a dam effect to slow the brook down and to be able to capture water somewhere up in there and then allow it to drain on a controlled basis. Interesting. But well, I don't will, know the details of it. We will stay tuned for that mitigation. Sounds interesting. Um, okay.
any, anything else? No, nothing else from Kathy. Um, we have our standing uh, items under reports. We have energy board, but I think Brian Callie gave it last time and is only doing it quarterly now. Um, zoning administrator is not here tonight, so I'll assume that that's nothing. Any reports from the ZBA except the hearing coming up? That's it. Okay. Um, so we can move on to the next, the next, which is continuing our review of the Reading Zoning Ordinance under the terms of our bylaw modernization grant. Um, and we're still working, trying to work in accordance with our work plan to get this done this calendar, uh, this, this calendar year mm -hmm. and off to the select board next, uh, before next January. So um, I am not aware that we had rema any remaining language issues except what we have written down here. So we were going to re-look re at parking and loading, um, continue looking at the subdivisions, and put a toe in the water on the accessory dwelling units, um, hope hoping to start that conversation tonight so we can maybe nail that down next time. Was there anything else that we needed to cover from last I think time? That, I think that's that's it. it. Okay. So should we jump into the parking and loading? Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I, I do want to say a couple things first. One, there was a piece of legislation called H687 that did pass in the veto session. It's over 200 pages long. Um, there is some stuff in there that affects zoning, so, um, and parking, actually. So at, from, at this point, they define a parking space as nine feet wide by 18 feet long. That's as big as it can be, unless it's for ADA purposes. Um, it can be smaller, like for a compact car or a motorcycle or something, but can't be bigger than that. So we'll have to put that in to our definition, I guess, of parking. Um, if there are pre-existing non-conforming spaces, parking spaces, and the, say at a two-unit house and they're going to turn it into a three-unit house or four-unit house, um, the pre-existing spaces do count towards uh, the required parking. And they also said if you have a valid legal agreement, you can, um, you may uh, count spaces in a nearby lot, have those count towards your required parking. And that's one thing that you, you have some language in here on that already. Uh, um. We do. So, pre existing non conforming parking, what is that? What would that be? They didn't really define it. So, and I don't know if they were only intending to sort of grandfather small parking spaces, but I mean, inadvertently, they're also grandfathering larger parking spaces because mm -hmm. it just says non conforming. So, like, I wonder what a non-conforming parking space yeah. would be, unless yeah. it's, like, too close to a lot line. Yeah. Is that what that means? Well, no, I mean, I, I'm actually, I'm assuming it means, you know, maybe it's 10 by 20 instead of 9 by 18. I guess they're saying you don't have to make them smaller if they're already there and they're, and they're bigger. Interesting. Okay. Eight. Why? Um, I don't know. Maybe they didn't want people to have to go to the expense of relining their entire lot or something like that. Um, so do we have to put that 9 by 18 back in? We were trying to take it out, as I recall, just to say, well, that was under the, that was under the ADA. Did we, did we have a, a space before, like um, a size? We do have a definition for a parking space, I believe. I think it had dimensions. I'll check that and I'll just substitute in these dimensions. In Article 7. That. And you, you do have language about the ADA parking has to follow federal regulation. Federal. And there's no problem with okay. that. Um, yes, we actually do have a definition of a parking space, although it was new in 
the course of this review, uh, but it's now wrong. So it's nine feet wide and 20 feet long. Right. So now it's 18? Correct. Yep. There were also changes in H687 that affect the accessory on farm business. So we'll Come have on. to incorporate those. We're done with that. Uh, you did finish that. It's, it makes it less restrictive, so. So will you be bringing that back to us at some So point? I can bring it back to you. I'll try to do it for the 30th. Yeah, why don't we do yeah. that while it's fresh in our minds? Yeah. If we wait too long, it'll be gone from my mind, that's for sure. Yeah. And then um, there's that list of things that you can review under site plan review, but only with regard to certain things like, um, you know, well, there's a whole list of things. Um, ch the churches and schools and things where your review authority is limited. And so they've added another thing to that list where your review authority is limited, and that is hotels and motels that are converted to affordable housing. Okay. Um, the only other... So, so other should, we, should we possibly overlay this for our next meeting? instead of getting into a lot of conversation about things that may apply to the new legislation? I can just bring in, yeah, I can just bring in the changes if you want to look at I them. think that would be efficient, yeah. don't, do you all? Sure, that's yeah. fine. Yep, yeah, that's fine. All right. So there's two other small things and I'll just, we'll show them to you next time. Um, so parking, I sent you all that draft, mm -hmm. highlighted in yellow, the things that were changed um, after sitting down with Eve a few weeks ago. So one thing that you were concerned about the language last time was the 3.7.1 parking in Felchville, the RCB district. It originally said it should be in the rear. If it can't be in the rear, it should be on the side. And there was concern, what if it can't be on the side? So now it says, if no other option is feasible in front of the building, provided that the planning commission or ZBA finds that there is adequate space for safe traffic and pedestrian circulation. Thoughts? It's a tough one. There's no space for even pedestrian circulation, let alone parking in the, on the sides. There's not even a shoulder on the road. Where, where are you thinking? On, on the front, on the fronts of these, like if with Trobus, there's really very little on the front. So, I mean, it's hard to make a regulation when we don't have the space to do anything right. in the front of the buildings. In the, I think in the case of what Trobus, you could maybe have an agreement to use this lot here. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But right, I don't know. You mean the public lots? Yeah. I don't know. Is it a public lot? I think it's, a, I, I, I have always assumed it was a public lot. It, the town owns it, right? Town owns it. That's what yeah. I have heard recently. Um, I mean, whether it's public or for town hall business, I don't know, but people treat it like a public lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's later in the regulations where, you know, Well, the number of on-site parking spaces required may be reduced under conditional use review if the ZBA determines that one or both of the following circumstances makes the strict application of the standards in 3.7.2a unnecessary. And then one of them is adequate provisions have been made for the shared use of a parking area on the same lot or on contiguous or adjacent lots by two or more establishments. So the number one of that paragraph seems pretty formal, like 
I, uh, I wouldn't imagine that it would be a long term lease, I would imagine it would be more informal an equivalent number of off site parking spaces. Um, have been procured or are available, and then, if we have to say something e.g. through a long term lease or otherwise by permission something a little less. I can't imagine here that there's going to be a lot of long term leasing of parking spaces at the town hall. Right, this may not be the only example, though, I guess is the question. Well, but so, it wouldn't have to be a lease. It could just be permission. Like if you I don't know, maybe you have a business that's in the evening and you ask the school, hey, do you mind if we park a couple cars over there in the evening and they say sure go ahead. It's not a, it's just by permission. It's not a lease. So I just wonder if we should loosen it up a little bit to say. Something less uh, transactional. Like an equivalent number of offsite parking spaces have been procured or are available. Through a long term lease or otherwise by permission. Would you want um, would you want it to be in writing or any any sort of I mean I'm thinking if you're if you're a ZBA and you're taking testimony and evidence at a conditional use hearing, what do you what are you gonna want? So this is on the town level only, right? This is not anything mandated by the state. So I, I sort of agree with Eve that it, it needs to be looser because first of all, we don't have that many existing situations and the existing situations that pop into my head right now, it's gonna be very challenging to procure long-term parking spaces and written agreements where right now, if there were the businesses, they would be sort of a sort, you know, neighborhood approach community spirited we want business yeah park at the school for instance or in the public lot i mean if we or said by permission, by what if, if we said you know someone can park by permission would we need a permission in writing no not necessarily so if i want to park at jane's house i want to park my couple cars in the evening at jane's house jane could come to the zba hearing and say yep I'm giving them permission. Right, but what mm -hmm. if she didn't want to come to the meeting and say I that? could handwrite permission. I think there would have to be email. some evidence yeah. that it was actually true. Right, I either verbal or yeah. written or emailed some, or something. something. Yeah. yeah, something. Yeah. But yes, I can make it less uh, long term leasey. <laughs> yeah, like a little less formal. Um, and, it, and it's have been procured or are available. I, yeah, if we make it a little a little less formal sounding, I mean, there there has to be some place to park cars if a business takes off. It, were we to be so lucky, that would be awesome. Um, I just don't want to make it any harder than it needs to be. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud here. So let's say the hardware store someone moves in there and starts a business they have an agreement with the greenhouse the greenhouse sells and the new owner says no you can't park here anymore then what does that existing business do for parking in the hardware store or the hardware store or whatever the hardware story evolves into yeah no, i mean it's a great point um but even if you did have say you had a well, I suppose if you had a long-term lease with them, that might that be a sign. Continue. Um, so, do you want it to stay long-term lease? No, 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 <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe they have to come back behind town hall or informally park it over. I don't know. That's a good question. In current times, it just doesn't seem like a problem, although it could become one. And then so, in, it would, in that light, can we address it if it does become an issue instead of making wolves 
or what if? Well, what would happen if that scenario played out? Someone started a business um, in that location and there was an informal agreement to park at behind at the greenhouse and then per permission was revoked to say that that business got sold what would happen would i think people would find other parking they would sneak behind town hall or go over to the school right i don't, I don't think they would go right on 106 well so i have a suggestion maybe before we solidify that we find out from bob allen whoever who can park there for what purposes can somebody park back there plus they're not they have to line it if it's not lined with spaces do they have to do it i mean so many <laughs> so many lots are not lined right yeah but being that it has to be each space has to be a certain i think size. we could just do the math of nine by 18. i think if you do line it you would yeah. have to do it nine by 18. yeah right so if it doesn't have to be lined so we can find out what we can do with that spot the space is back there what would be permitted and then it would be like not a problem if what trobe is open as another store or something else down the road or whatever exactly <clears throat> i don't think there's any signs on that lot restricting any access or awesome. overnight parking or anything like that. I've never, I haven't seen it, but I whiz in yeah. and out of there. So I don't really know. Right. There, I don't think there is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, we, I'm with you on less restrictions on this. If we had so many booming businesses that parking became a problem. <laughs> then we could address it. <laughs> what a nice problem to have, right? Right. Um, all right, I have made a note to ask the someone on the select board if there are any if there are any constraints around the town hall parking lot. We'll see what they say. Mm -hmm. I think right now it's just a you need to park. Go ahead. But right. So going back to Section 3.7.1, I mean, so you've said preferably in the back if not there in the side, if not there in the mm -hmm. front, if you mm -hmm. have adequate pedestrian and uh, traffic circulation, and you can add another or in accordance with section, whatever that is, 3.73C or whatever, um, which will make less formal. Mm -hmm. And then you have even more options. Okay. And on that last thing, that last part about parking in the front, um, if we wanted to keep that concept, rather than say, provided the PC or ZBA finds there's adequate space for safe traffic and pedestrian circulation, we could say something like, finds that um, such parking does not create an unsafe condition. Because the, the conditions are what the conditions are. It's, there may not be adequate space for pedestrian circulation, but if someone is parking in the front, it's not exacerbating or creating an unsafe condition. Does that make sense, Jane, to what you were talking about? It makes sense, but then how do we police that? If well, somebody we, is parking how there. Do we police anything? Exactly. Right. I, I think it's, I mean, they have to, Park on their land. They can't park in the two-foot shoulder. Uh, that park, the, the parking space has to be on their property, and nobody else has a right to be walking on their property. Okay, anyway. that's for okay. But we're talking about business too. Yeah, I was just talking about the three point seven point one. Okay. The which is well, if they want to park in their front lawn, they could do that. And again, right. this is just. Non-residential. Non-residential. Yeah, so if I have a business and I have a building, I can put parking in the front, but it has to be on my property. Mm -hmm. um, and it can't, can't be the cause of an unsafe condition or create an unsafe condition. 
generally also, I mean, the highway department or the state has a right of way that's mm -hmm. usually right wider than the road. Mm -hmm. And I think they frown on mm -hmm. you parking in their right of way. <laughs> so yes. how about that? Provided it's not in the state or town highway right of way. Yeah. State and it's not creating an unsafe condition. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say if it's not in the right of way, that's all we need to say, because then it's going to be. Well, the right of way, if I'm not mistaken, it's what, 25 feet from center line. So that would that could really encroach into someone's usable space. Well, if it's the Parking same on the way, old state yeah. highway. Yeah. If it's 106, you would have to get permission from the state anyway. So looking across the street right now at the building that used to be the general store, there's a very thin strip where people would park. Is that thin strip considered right of way? That would part of that would be a right of way. I would think I'm not sure what the town setback is from center line, but I know the state road setback is 25 feet. It's, it's so then that totally doesn't work. It's yeah, I mean, you've got a pretty dangerous condition there mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. people backing out into traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you said you can't park in a right of way and you they can't have, have a condition, that condemns that building from ever being used commercially. Exactly. Except that there's this big spot right, right across and the street. If we can use this. So, yeah, but people have been parking over there for right. well, we'll put you put no parking signs up. Hundred years. Right. Have we ever had a have we ever had an accident? Wait, 100 years? Well, don't ask me that. Oh, that's tricky. I mean I mean it's true for how many years people parked there, but it doesn't mean they should have. I mean, and you may want to make it parallel to the road yeah. rather than people backing out into the highway. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Right. They're going to do right. it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You're our voice of reason, <laughs> Mr. Johnson. Um, well, Provided the PC or ZBA finds that it does not create an undue unsafe condition or that does not create a dangerous condition. Unsafe seems well, that sounds a little elementary school right now. Well, do we have to put in that that it doesn't obstruct the right of way? I, I, after that last conversation, I don't think we should, because I think that would be too restrictive. And right of way doesn't mean they have to have access to it all the time for all purposes. No, but I'm saying that do we have to put it in so that we acknowledge there is a right of way, but whoever's going to park there is going to park there anyway. I don't think we should, because no. if, I don't think we should, uh, because if if they need a right of way to fix an underground pipe or do something, yeah, um, they'll give notice and they can do that and tell okay. people. You may, I mean, there, there's usually already regulations in place through, I mean, the town usually has rules about their highway and where you can park and what you can do and where you can plow snow and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So it'd be good to know what Reading's regulations already are. Can we just defer to that and with, say, uh, finds that it does not create a dangerous condition and pursuant to state and town regulations. I don't, I don't want to try to figure out what the town rules are at this point in time and insert them here. So if they have rules about that, people need to follow that or, or we don't have to mention it at all. They just have to, they have this and then they have that. I usually like to point at things to give people a clue, but. Mm -hmm. Might be nice to know what. So would it be, on the p person parking or the person that owns the business for people to park there with the onus i think it would be on the owner the business owner of enforcing or no. of even supplying you know saying you can park here or not 
Well, when they come, say, okay, so someone buys that and they want to put a different business in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's been a general store, so it could be a general store again without mm -hmm. coming to you for permission to be a general store, assuming they do it within two years. It's or done already. You can't. Pardon what? You can't. It's over. The permits, the, the permit for a general store is gone. It has to be reapplied. I think it was for. six and twelve months in the, yeah. under the old pre-existing non-conforming yep. use. I thought you had made it two or three years. But, um... We we did, but it's not. Oh, yet it's right. Enforced. Right. Okay, you're right. right. Six. You're right. If that yeah. gets adopted by <laughs> yeah. the select board, then no, it's a whole right. new situation. <laughs> okay, so it was a right. good idea, though, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So someone puts a gym in there or something. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, I love that idea. And they're yeah, coming to you for okay for a parking permit <laughs> for conditional use approval. Um, mm -hmm. Then, then it's going to come up for you. So, may I, I? My my huge concern with this conversation is the more restrictions we put on these existing what used to be businesses, the less likely we're going to attract a business. If we start lopping off their parking ability next to what was Watroba's, that they're having a hard time. They've had a hard time selling it over the past several years. We're just making it even more difficult for them to try to sell it. And that goes not only for that structure, it goes for several others in town too. And do we want to be responsible for taking that opportunity away by adding these restrictions? No, I mean, it doesn't sound like you do. <laughs> no, I don't. Right, what, I'm saying is, so what I'm saying, like taking Watrobas, for example, if that right of way is part of the town Tyson Road and somebody's part and the owner of Watroba, the new Watrobas, allows somebody to park there, then who's at fault? The parker or the parkee? <laughs> I don't think person... we need to worry about the right of way unless the town or the state needs to do something in the right of way but unless it's right in the snow plow we're, we're saying we're saying the purse you need to comply with the state and you know town rules about right of way when you park so anybody who wants to do anything has to comply with all the rules that apply right whether we have it in our code or not so if someone wants to put some parking across the street for the new fabulous gym and wants to put it in the town's right of way, we could say for our purposes, sure, go ahead. But there are other rules out there you need to look towards, which is true in many circumstances, right? Like, sure, build your house there, but you better check out the septic and sewer and the water, you know? So I'm not too concerned about the right of way. Um, stepping away from the language here, just think, thinking generally, what do we think about parking? I mean, I sort of think a business should provide uh, adequate parking for their purposes. Do we want to drill down on that? Do we want to say that it should be in the back or the side or the front? If someone has a turns their house into a successful business um, or changes the use of their building from residential to a great business or turns one of these businesses back into a business, does it ruin everybody else's life to have a whole bunch of cars now parked all around their backyard? I don't know. Well, that can all get solved if that's useful. Stacey, well, so, what do you think, so like, just stepping back, so like, what do you think it should be? You know, I, again, I, I just, I'm not for adding more restrictions and covenants to to scare people away. Um, parking, I think I like the safety idea because everyone should be safe. If you're parked at a diagonal at what used to be Rotrobas, you back out of there haphazardly and you run into somebody, then, you know, that's why we all have insurance, hopefully. But, you know, there is a liability if there's not, if there's restrictions and there's no signage then it would also probably fall on the business owner too. 
um, if there's signage, then that's sort of a release of liability. If you have a sign up there saying park across the street in the public lot, if that's permissible, then, you know, the business owners off the hook, so to speak. And, and, you know, somebody's going to park there no matter what, because people just, they're not going to want to walk across the, the street to a store. Um, if it's a new application, like, you know, let's say the barn next to the firehouse, a business goes in that barn, then there's lots of space to create parking and you can have these restrictions and covenants, but that's in the village center, we're, we're really restricted. And I don't think we want to start adding more restrictions. I, I don't think these places will ever get filled with a, a business of any sort, let alone, um, it, it'll even be, you know, tough for a residential application if they convert it to a residential in some cases. And like Eve said, you know, people have been parking there for decades, generations, and now all of a sudden we want to restrict it and change it. I, I'm not on board with that. I was hoping this one would be an easy one, but it's <laughs> more complicated. So the language we have right at the top, the first paragraph, that in my copy anyway is black and not blue, uh, refers to public roads and right of ways. Is that new language as of this zoning redo, or was that originally in the code as we had it prior to the grant review? That's original, but I don't have the original. Okay. With me. And so what it says now is that unless other unless otherwise allowed by the PC or ZBA under site plan or conditional use review traffic associated with any use shall be parked off public roads and rights of way makes sense. Uh, although the rights of way huh? parking and loading spaces which shall be graveled or paved shall be provided in accordance with the following requirements when any new use is established or an existing use is expanded. Do we need to say more than that? Is that enough? You can cross out paragraph 3.7.1. Yeah, I, I think that's where we're ending up. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you suggest that earlier? And then we have 3.7 point. So 3.7.2, two, when, when you and I met Eve, yeah. um, so the prior board had, if, if, you're, if you're in an area with water and sewer service, then you can only require one space per dwelling unit. If you're not, you can require one and a half spaces per dwelling unit. What's the we were at one um, when you and I were talking. I think you felt more comfortable with one and a half and wanted to talk about that with yeah Jane and Stacy. So, so the old code required two spaces per home. The state now says that if you have water and sewer, you can't require more than one. Is that right? Right. I got that right. But if you don't have water and sewer, you can, you require, can require one, one and, and a half. half. You can, but you don't have to. You don't have to. Okay. Well, you can't require more than one and a half. But you could require less. Less. You could go to the water, the public water yes, sewer standard. Yes. So. Yeah, I mean, it's depending on which way you look at it. My thinking was most homes that have a, a family or a couple are going to have two cars. And if you only require one space, is that realistic? Um, but maybe it's too, maybe we should just jump ahead to the public water and sewer standard and say one. 
Is that realistic? They you know? can have more. They can it's have not more. saying they can't have more. It's okay. just saying they have, to have a minimum of one. You can't require more. I can so. I can go with that. I can mm -hmm. be convinced of that. Mm -hmm. So the one too. or the one and a half? One. I say one. Okay. One. Okay. One and a half. So we'll is go back to one. Weird. I can argue it both ways, and I can probably convince myself of either one, but I'm happy <laughs> to do one. Um, so that's down from two. So then we don't need the rounded up because you'll always be with the whole number. Correct. And then I had changed it to 1.5 under number five, but we'll change it back to one. Mm -hmm. So just so I'm on the same page, 3.7.1, what was, what was our final on that or not? We're striking it? We're okay. it up. okay. That's what I thought I heard. I just want to make sure. So the, the 3.7.2 will now be 3.7.1 and so forth. Um, so Martha, on the on the numbers as they go through here, we used to have a similar construct in the old code. Some of the things have changed to be more permissive, like restaurants used to have one space for every three seats. Now it's one space for every four seats. Is that required? Is that suggested? Is that just what we feel comfortable with? Is that what the state says? Does the state say anything? The state had, um, they put out a thing called zoning for great neighborhoods and they had suggested four parking for different uses. And okay. I believe it was four. Okay. For so that's consistent with the state's recommendation. And it's not a requirement, it's a, you know, okay. suggestion. Um, and then small business, that hasn't changed one space for 400 feet professional office, one space, that's gone up. It used to be 250 feet, now it's 400 feet, and that's consistent with that recommendation. Right. I don't think I have I can send that to you guys. If and then on the B&B, &B, that's now one instead of one and a half, is that what you just said? Yeah. Libraries and museums? Yeah, I mean, I had done uh, the last group asked me to look into that. So I looked at for some other options and um, a thousand is kind of in the middle. So like, how big is our library? Does anybody know? Library is pretty small. Oh, yeah, I would say it's probably what 18, 1900 square feet. So, so under this standard, we'd need more parking. Two parking spaces plus one for the employee. We need three. Three, which they have, right? They have like four or five, correct? In oh. front of that. I don't think in it's five. You probably squeeze in three. But that's four. one person behind four. somebody else. You can do four across. You can four do that. across. You can do. Shanann four. says four. Four. I don't know. I think a lot of that's People double up. Well, doubling up is one thing, but it's not. Yeah, that's not. You could do four spaces. All right, so let's say it's fine for libraries. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> the Hall Art Foundation has plenty of room for parking. They use their field. Um, okay, so those seem fine. So what's what's the display or exhibit? What's why is that an addition? That. The display or right. what's the purpose of adding that? Does Isn't it the same as display? Because they have things on display. Uh, gross display or exhibit area. I think that was something you wanted to add. I think that came out of the recommended. That wasn't me. I wouldn't know anything about that. But it's it's. Uh, I think it's saying that if your if your library or your art gallery or your historic space is the display areas are X big. That is your parking requirement. But I think that that came out of that um, recommendation, didn't it? I, I thought it was something that you, you didn't, so you didn't want to, I think, you know, there's back office space and all that other space. And I think you just wanted to clarify that it was only the 
exhibit space that's open to the public that's being measured in this case. But I could be remembering wrong. That just doesn't sound like something I focus on, but I could be wrong too. Um, so maybe we need to go back and look at those recommendations about parking for great neighborhoods. Yeah, I'll, I'll look at it and I'll send it to you. And I don't know, as I said, I don't know that they specifically covered museums and libraries. I did some independent poking around to find out what some other towns do because they don't all have museums or mm -hmm. libraries. So. I, that is not my language because I remember looking at it and thinking, what does that mean? Um, okay. I know, it, just <laughs> seems, it seems redundant to me, display or exhibit. It, it should be one or the other, I would think. I mean, we can just cross it out. I mean, we could do one parking space for every thousand square feet of public space, area open to the public, and one per employee. Sounds good to me. So every thousand square feet of space open to the public, is that what you said? I think that works. Okay. Um, so then there's that, well, I think you were okay with uh, B, additional space that you may require additional off-street off -street parking or loading spaces for any non-residential use subject to ZBA or PC review if you find that the minimum number of spaces is not sufficient. I guess I think that is reasonable discretion, which hopefully would not be enforced if it wasn't necessary. Right. But if it is necessary, it's probably good to have it there just in case. Right. And then the fewer spaces, if we make that less legal sounding and if spaces are available or have been procured in an adjacent public or private lot, if we add are available, you're not. Yeah, I mean, is it too loose to, to say the number of on-site in, in letter C, the number of on-site parking spaces may be reduced uh, under conditional use review if the CBA determines that uh, there is sufficient off-site parking spaces nearby nearby that are available <laughs> I mean, it's still under the ZBA's purview. Um, I think the the less the less strict we can make that sound, probably the better. If the ZBA determines that there is sufficient available parking nearby, And then it'll be a factual determination about what does available mean. Mm -hmm. And I guess if that doesn't work, it can always be updated. Maybe a condition of initial use review. If the ZBA determines that there that sufficient parking is available nearby, and then cross out everything else. What do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to imagine I'm a, an attorney from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and I'm, and they tend to use this word standard, standard list discretion. Um, they prefer to see under what circumstances and such, so what's sufficient. You know, I'm just, that's my beat. Yeah, no, I hear um, you. Tim, 
Jane, Stacy, your thoughts? I, I like what you proposed. <laughs> I, I think, you know, again, I'm sorry, I, I just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a broken record about, you know, the less restrictions, the, you know, we're a community, we need to work together. And I understand the legal and liability part of it with the VLCT attorneys. And there, if something were to come up, they would want to have some something to work with. But I, I think we're hinging on scaring away people. I think in a town like this, in a village like Felchville, the reality of anybody entering into a long-term lease for parking just doesn't seem realistic. I think, I think what we're saying is that we're comfortable trying the more flexible standard and leaving it up to the ZBA's discretion that there's sufficient parking available nearby. Yeah, I agree. Okay. All right. Well, that took a while to get to that. Um, ADA, bicycles, EVs, any comments on any of those? Thanks. Thank you. Loading. You were fine with all those. It was the loading that I reworded under right. 3.7.6. Rather than to not even loading, this is pretty flexible. So I have a couple of notes in that first paragraph. It says, if required, if required by who? By, by the zoning board yes. or by select board or by who? By the zoning board. Okay, so I, I think that should be, I, I would define that. So, so that add, it, if required by the zoning board, yeah. space reserved for, yeah. okay. And then I don't like the last paragraph at all, the loading space. The definition? Yeah, the loading, say an off-street parking space of sufficient size to accommodate the type I mean, there's just so many variables there. And I think, again, it's just, it's restrictive. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought you would like that because it's a little bit flexible and vague. <laughs> Rather than trying to say it's got to be, you know, 12 by 40 or... I'm thinking it's got to be nothing. That there it's got to be That there is no, I mean... Where is somebody going to be able to provide a loading space that can't be a parking space? Well, so right about it's saying where feasible to facilitate the loading and unloading okay. of delivery where vehicles, feasible, then. Yeah. there shall be provided one off street loading space okay. per every 10,000. Where per feasible. Feet. Okay. Okay. So if it's not so, feasible, then. But you have you don't to define to loading space if you're going to have it in there. What, you know, what is it? Do we have to have and this space? is not you know it's probably more typical to say a loading space is you know 15 feet wide 40 feet long blah 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 to accommodate a tractor trailer truck so this one just says an off street space of sufficient size sufficient so it's up to you to determine whether it's sufficient or not i like that to accommodate the type of delivery vehicle expected you know, because not everyone's going to have a tractor trailer track. They might just have box trucks coming, which are much smaller. So maybe they don't need as big a space. And located logically and conveniently to facilitate bulk pickups and deliveries. I mean, it's, I'm it's okay. it has a lot of flexibility in it. I mean, other short of not defining it, which you don't normally want to do in zoning, if you're going to use the term, you want to define it. Somehow. So th that that doesn't bother me because it is all qualified by where feasible. So to me, it seems like 
a, an aspirational roadmap to how you think about loading zones where feasible. And if it's not feasible, the discretion is with the ZBA to not require that, presumably. I'm not even aware that Reading has a building that has 10,000 square feet. Right, I mean, the greenhouse may collectively and all their, I don't know, without we count all the greenhouses and whatnot, I don't know. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I don't know. I'm okay with this one unless yeah. anyone else as is long not as okay. We're feasible. Is yeah. Okay. And if we say if required by the CBA, making that change. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, there's our parking. So with those changes, we're done. We don't have any other uh, things to consider. We're going to look into. We're going to look into whether or not the park. Out of curiosity, we're going to look into whether or not the parking lot is um, public, but I don't think that matters for our determination of this language. Okay. The next thing on our agenda is uh, oh, subdivision language. These are proposed changes for section 5.6. We had already looked at some of it, lot line adjustments and minor subdivisions and proposed language for major subdivisions. As a reminder, the big change here is allowing the local zoning administrator to approve both lot line adjustments and minor subdivisions without it going to the PC. Mm -hmm. um, major subdivisions still go to the PC. So Martha, do you want to remind us where we got to and have we have we solidified any of it? No, we haven't. Really. We have didn't we? get very far. We didn't get very far. Okay. So let's take a step back. The real gating question is, uh, I, I think the reason that the state wants it to go to the ZA rather than going to the full PC is to make some things easier. So if you're just in adjusting a lot line mm -hmm. or um, doing just a two lot subdivision rather than requiring all of the uh, process of a planning commission hearing and all of the stuff under that, the ZA has a, a discretion to do, just do it under these circumstances. Is that right? And the state allows it. They don't require it. State allows it. So, um, so we could allow it also or not right so what do we think is this a good idea for lot line adjustments mm -hmm. or yes. uh just a two lot subdivision mm -hmm. are we okay yes. with our zoning administrator doing it mm -hmm. yes. okay um so that's the big part of this and then it's just the the details Yeah, so even I went through this up to the section 5.6.5 design standards, so. And I have some yellow in my printout. Is yellow things that are flagged? I was trying to, yeah, because you can't track changes to changes. Yeah. <laughs> so I was trying to highlight things that were different. So the red is additional language, proposed additional language, and then the yellow highlighted is new in addition to that. Right. So the red was there last time you looked at it. And then the yellow, and I don't know if I may have missed things, so it might not be perfectly correlated, but the yellow is new or changed from the last time you saw it. Oh, okay. And or maybe I put a comment on it somewhere. It's funny, in my version it's blue, but uh, I will assume that's right on yours. So um, I looked, I did look over this with Martha when we were preparing for this meeting and compared it with the old one. I, we haven't really looked at the major subdivision language very carefully. I like the 
I like the drafting that Martha has done here because it clarifies a lot of stuff and I think makes it more readable and um, approachable than it was before and makes it more accurate than it was before. There was language before around what had to be stamped on a map and it just didn't seem right. Um, so I, I think that this is a nice setup for this section because um, it has the general applicability and it talks about filing requirements down in sec subsection seven and then it goes to a new section for the lot line adjustments and a new section for the minor subdivisions. Mm -hmm. um, so as a setup, I, I like it. I think it is much more readable and understandable than before. Yeah. Um, and did you guys go through it and yeah. you have notes and comments or questions or yeah. should we just go through the whole I've been through it pretty carefully with you before okay. and except yeah. for any questions that we had sort of full board should, you know, think about whether we want that or not. I'm pretty comfortable with it. So I think it's Stacy and Jane, it's more to you to to uh, point out stuff that seems good or bad. Well, to me, so, it's go ahead. Fun. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Sorry. No, just that it, it it's clearer. It's more direct than, so I'm not sure about little details, but the whole thing seems more clear. Yeah, I think the format is clear. There are there are some little details that I have question and, and, and pause about. Um, 5611, where it says approval required. Um, I think that that's, good language until we get to i'm not sure what the and question mark means um if it means if we're going from set forth in section and before any construction i think i'm was, not i think grading was, i'm sorry go ahead i think it was your suggestion eve to add <laughs> and and i and as i was reviewing it i'm like i don't know um, I don't know if I like the end. <laughs> let, let's keep talking and I'll see if I can find my markup from before. Um, well, I, I, I'm assuming it's just a carry on set forth in this and before any construction. I, I think where it gets concerning for me is the grading the, and the clearing. And I'm not sure what land development may commence. I don't, I, that's a little murky for me, but a lot of, exploration of land on whether you can build or or develop it subdivide it you need to do a bit of grading and clearing to get to whether or not it's feasible i don't think so that I was and i think it was i think the and was as set forth in this section and did we need to reference another section i, I don't think it was in re reference to the grading and clearing which I think was referring back to like the first paragraph of the whole code. But if it doesn't make sense, then it's just yeah, a whole. I might get up to that point. And I think if we need to clarify before any construction, because that seems like an obvious to me, but it may not be to others. So, but the grading, the clearing, and then I don't know what, again, I don't know what the land development may commence means. I think the and is not needed. I think that can just be deleted. So what is land development referred to? So, well, land development is, that's a state, I believe it's a state definition and it's pretty broad. So, so I think it's, um, if you look in literally the first page of the zoning code, there's a little inset box that defines land development under state law. Land development means the division of a parcel into two or more parcels, construction, reconstruction, conversion, structural alteration, relocation, enlargement of a building, uh, mining, excavation, landfill, and any change in the use of any building or other structure or land or extension of use of land. So that is already in the code at this, 
That's like thing number one of the code. So then do you need construction grading and clearing? So you can just say before land any development. land development may commence. Right. I like that, Jane. So if we say land development, let's at least point us back to right. section C1. Section. Yeah, section, as defined, as described in article one. Mm -hmm. It's probably also in your definitions, but we can check that. Mm -hmm. Yep, but it's shorter in our, it's shorter in our uh, definitions. Well, I, I can compare and see what's missing. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, good. We just, we just deleted some words. And then section two is just pointing out that, you know, reminding people they might need a state permit. Mm -hmm. um, section three, I think this yellow language is what Martha had added in in response to our group feeling like um, a public road does not automatically create a subdivision. Is that right, Martha? Yes, after that meeting, I, I was looking for something else and found in the state wastewater regulations that they consider if a lot is divided by a public road, they consider it separate lots. And we talked about that and it doesn't necessarily have to mean that Reading considers it separate lots, but just in discussing it again, even I thought anyway that if both lots conform mm -hmm. to the minimum requirements, then why not? Mm -hmm. But you don't want to do it automatically because mm -hmm. then people, there was concern about people being taxed for a develop, developable lot mm -hmm. if they didn't want one. Mm -hmm. So that's where this language came from. So okay. we're an existing public road and bisects a parcel, the right of way may only be considered a boundary dividing line if both lots meet review standards for a minor subdivision and they have a zoning permit approving the subdivision from the ZA. Otherwise, it's not automatic. So, and I, th I think that's good language to put in there because Martha pointed out that where you don't have any language, it has led to litigation, mm -hmm. um, which is not helpful for anybody. So I, I am, I am at least, me personally, I'm comfortable having it be clear that it is not creating, the public road is not creating that. Um, right. Or like not. you said, so I, I'm good with this, unless yeah. anyone is not. Good with it. Yep. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, types of subdivisions. There are three types of subdivision in Reading is yellow. Why is that yellow? It, it was just worded a little differently. I think oh. it said Reading recognizes three types of subdivision. That's it. Oh. And you and I had this discussion about whether a lot line is a subdivision, and either I looked it up or we decided that it was. Uh, so just worded a little differently. Okay. Same meaning. Seems self explanatory. So, reviewing authority. Um, I think we added the that meet all applicable standards at the last meeting. At least I have a note that yep. we did. Um, I think that makes sense. I don't think we added anything else. Um, so we're assuming that the zoning administrator will know backwards and forwards, inside and out. The I think, regulations. I think we're going to have to assume that for all purposes. Okay. Uh, I I'm, I would think that our current zoning of Bob, of course, um, would have, and I think he, he does, 
or informal types of conversation is uh, like a punch list, you know, for lot line adjustments, which is, you know, that's obvious lot line adjustment, but for a standard subdivision, it should be if it meets this amount of frontage, this does it have a driveway permit, does it meet the minimum acreage requirements? And, you know, he'll probably go through it and be like, yes, 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 no. And then if it's a no, there's an issue and it has to be kicked so back. So you know that there's a punch list? I do not know, but I would think okay. there would be. I, I remember the old planning commission was talking about creating a punch list which I think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And it would also help for people who are considering it too. You know, right. to give you're to planning on doing a subdivision, does it meet this, 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 and this? And if it does, then it's a minor subdivision. Right. Please go to the ZA. You wouldn't probably put it in your regulations, so you probably just no, be, but you I'm know, just, saying... just something that Bob would have to. Well, I, you know. I would say there are, that might be, I mean, I feel like our agenda and our plate is full through December. Um, creating some flow charts, punch lists for a few of these things might be really helpful for Reading uh, at some point. So Martha, you were talking about how when you were looking, when you were over in West Windsor and you were asked for a variance, when you were the zoning administrator, you would have like a flow chart. Or a punch list. Is it is it this? If yes, then this. Is it no? Just so it's not all running around in your head. So I would love to see us at some point create some usable tools for residents, property owners, and also the zoning administrator. We're I think we're lucky enough to have a volunteer zoning administrator who's been doing this for a long time. I expect that someday we will have a new one who will um, benefit from a tool that will be a guideline for that person. Um, so just keep a keep that in the back of your minds. Um, so yeah, once so we I, get through this, then we'll have all the tools to create those flowcharts, punch lists. Yeah, with exactly. nothing to do. With nothing to do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we've right. already been told we have to revise the town plan before our 10 year deadline. Well, not until 2030. I mean, yeah. you know, you we had strong encouragement for... from Mark, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so if the ZA denies a permit for a lot line adjustment or a minor subdivision, the applicant can take that to the ZBA as an appeal. And if the maybe uh, It'd be appealed to the ZBA. Is it ZBA or the PC? And then we say a de decision by the PC to issue or deny. Oh, for any subdivision, it may be appealed to the environmental court. It's, I believe it's the zoning board that um, hears appeals of ZBA a uh, ZA decisions. So we, so we, so ZA denial goes to ZBA. PC denial presumably for a major subdivision, right? Because, or no, we could be doing one of the others, goes to the environmental court. What about ZA denial and then ZBA denial? Can someone take that to the environmental court too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So should it say a decision by the PC or ZBA to issue or deny a permit for any subdivision? Just to close the loop on the Roadmap. So we conduct all of our hearings through the ZBA, not the PC. Right. So we say we, we say what happens if the so the PC might be the kind of first line for determining a subdivision certainly a major subdivision, but it could be a, a lot line or a minor if the ZA says you guys do it. And but if we don't permit it, then it says here that we they can take that to the environmental court. I'm just wondering if we should say if the ZBA denies it because the ZA, the ZA has denied it, the applicant comes to the ZBA to appeal, the ZBA denies it, it's silent as to the environmental court, do we need to also say, just as a courtesy, um, that it also goes to the environmental court? 
Well, if the ZBA approves it, then it's approved. Yeah, but if they deny it, if they deny it, then yes, then you could have the absolutely elsewhere in your zoning. I think it says that appeals of ZBA decisions go to the environmental court, but I can check that. If we we're put just in... adding a layer, we're, we're adding a layer. So if the ZA can potentially approve or deny it, if it's denied by him in this case, it would go to the ZBA. If it's approved, then it's null. They move forward. If it's denied, then they have the opportunity to appeal to the court. If we just, so we're just adding ZA layer, right? Yeah. yeah. But Where they... we say a decision by the PC to issue or deny a permit for any subdivision may be appealed to the court. Right. If we just say and insert a decision by the PC or ZBA to issue or deny may be appealed well, to the but environmental court. They would court. be, I, I don't know that they would automatically then be approving the subdivision. They would just, they're just hearing the appeal of the decision of the ZA. And they can say, I think you made a mistake on this. Oh, so they you don't know, actually because, approve it. I don't think they necessarily, as part of that, would then approve the subdivision. Um, but whether they would then kick it back to the ZA to reconsider or kick it to the PC, that's a good question. That never, uh, yeah. that um, never occurred to me. I, yeah. Can we check that out? Yeah, yeah. I guess I'd like to, I'd like to have the path be clear. So if we're saying mm -hmm. the path for the PC is appeal to the environmental, what's the path if the ZBA also denies it? That can also go to the environmental. We just need to figure out where the modifiers go. Yeah. Could yeah, the ZBA- Yeah, for everyone to understand is important. Yeah. Could the ZBA, on appeal, approve a subdivision, or do they have to put it to right. the PC or and the I GI? Have to, I have to. That's the question. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not understanding what the PC has the involvement of the PC. They're um, in charge of subdivisions. They're in charge of making the regulations for subdivisions. They're in charge of making the determination for the subdivision it's weird yeah i well i guess maybe the confusing part of it for for me Jane, maybe is that we've always had the same members on both the Z planning commission right where they were two if they were two independent member you know different member groups then so well, because I'm thinking that the PC creates the regulation, and then for everything else, if there's an, a, you know, something else, it goes to the ZBA. But the PC on subdivisions is kind of the first, except for now we're creating it for the zoning administrator, the PC is the first, the court of first impression on subdivisions. So if someone, if I want to subdivide my property, I don't go to the Z ZBA, I go to the PC. No, you only go to the ZBA if the zoning administrator sends you to the ZBA because you need something special. I would only go to the ZBA if the zoning administrator denied my first two, those first two ones. If it's a, if it's a major subdivision, you never go to the ZBA. Am I correct on that? So if it's a major subdivision, you go to the PC, okay. and the PC decides whether or not to grant the subdivision. And if the subdivision is not granted, they go straight to the environmental court. Right, so the ZBA is out of it. Of major subdivisions, but not of minor yeah. and not of lot lines because we have this new construct of the ZA. So now if it's a minor one or a lot line, it would go ZA first, they, if the ZA denies, the applicant can appeal to the ZBA. Okay. If the ZBA denies, then it goes to the environmental. Then they board. can appeal to environmental. If they don't deny and they want to approve, then what happens? That's the question. Did I get right. that right? Yeah. Did I glaze you? It's over? a little. Um... 
<laughs> it is confusing in a town where you're where everything you're completely is overlapped. the same. Yeah. yeah. Right. So sometimes if you want one board to do all the planning and the other to do all the development review, you know, you and can you switch to, to a DRB right. and a planning commission. Okay. We can't even fill our two empty seats, so let's not do yeah. that. <laughs> okay, so that's a that's a question to be answered for next time. Mm -hmm. um, the survey plat recording requirements. Martha has tweaked this a lot so that I think it reads a lot better and makes more sense. But any questions? <clears throat> The, yeah, that, that, I think the recording, all of that is good. Um, down right above the signature line, do we need to put in zoning administrator or planning commission? Because it makes it, the way it reads now is that you would almost think that it needs both signatures. Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah, the, so the intent there, and maybe, I don't know if there's another way to make it clear, was that you pick one, like in the first brackets, it's lot line adjustment, minor subdivision, major subdivision. You're only gonna pick one depicted on this survey plat was approved by the zoning administrator, planning commission, one or the other in conjunction with the permit number, which has an effective date, blah, 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 so. Mm -hmm. But if there's a clearer way. I mean, if you did zoning administrator and then like you could put in capital letters or planning commission right. chair. Yeah. I mean, should should that happen in the other brackets as well? Lot line adjustment or minor subdivision or major subdivision? Somehow it makes more sense mm -hmm. up top. Mm -hmm. It uh, makes more sense the way it is up top or? Well, I, sure. I mean, maybe put um, in the ors there too, just to keep it consistent yeah I would put the ors in. and then maybe if you if you put them in capitals it'll be hopefully clear that that's the that's what we're trying to accomplish okay okay 5.6.2 Let's see, a lot line adjustment. Is the realignment or relocation of the dividing lines between existing lots? Application requirements. An applicant for a lot line adjustment shall submit the following complete lot line adjustment application that meets the requirements of section 6.0.2. All applicable applications fees, a survey plat as defined in Article 7 and 27 BSA 1401 that meets the requirements of Section 5.3.5.1. I meant to send that to you, that section. I added some things to it. There seem to be some things that should be in there <laughs> that weren't in there. So I'll send you that. This is our Section 5.3.5.1? Yeah, 5.3.5.1. Yeah, so is that site plan review? It's five point three. Yeah. So it for, in, for instance, it it said I think it said the height of buildings and the location of buildings, but not the footprint. Typically, you know, I think you would want to know the footprint of the building. Um, oh, so you're saying there's things that we should be adding into our site plan review like a footprint. Right, and I think footprint might be in under section 6.0.2. It just, it would be nice to have it all in one place. Yeah, great. Yeah. So I will send you that. Okay. Review standards. Can we write that it should be on a piece of paper? 
because I was joking with somebody the other day that you could write it on the back of a napkin and submit it. A survey plot? A survey plot you could oh. put on it. I'm talking about like, you know, if you, or like an extension on your house. You could write it on the back of a napkin and I, submit it. Yeah. I'm not sure that would get accepted <laughs> by the town clerk, would it? Oh, yeah. Not for a recording. A napkin. Okay. Um, there's nothing in here for me personally that I am troubled by. Right. On the lot line adjustments. Yes. The standards are all okay, I think. I think it makes sense to have have this be less burdensome if, if two adjacent property owners need to adjust their lot lines. Um, the biggest part I was concerned of with is that it doesn't create a non-conformance, which that that's covered here. So uh, I'm fine with that. Yeah, and I'm looking at 5351 and it says all site plans, the location, height and spacing of its existing and proposed structures. That would be outlined on the survey, I would think. Open spaces in their landscaping, driveways, off street parking spaces, all other physical features, including surface waters and wetlands, stone walls, fences, and elevations, acreage and entire parcel with existing and proposed lot boundaries, and then areas designated by the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. What, what are you thinking to add, Martha? I'll pull it up um, if I can. I thought I was opening it, but I don't know. Oh, there it is. Okay. And we can it, we can save it for next time if, if it so the first one all site plans a i added it says the location height i said the location footprint height and spacing um i didn't change anything about b or c and under d instead of just driveways i put existing and proposed accesses, driveways, easements, right-of-ways, and utilities. Uh, nothing for E, off-street parking, F, all other features, including but not limited to surface waters, wetlands, and applicable setbacks, stone walls, etc. And then under G, dimensions and acreage of entire parcel with existing and proposed lot lines. Just change the word from boundaries to lines. Um, Cause in, in well, addition- I think that, that language would help us identify pretty quickly whether or not it creates a non-conforming situation. It, it would be helpful, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, where we talk about uh, let's see, five points. We talk about um, application requirements and we say a survey plat as defined in Article 7 and 27 VSA 1401. I'm not seeing survey plat in our definitions. Should it be? So I'm not seeing that in Article 7. Let me look. Would it be under survey plat? And then it should be capitalized, I guess. Okay. 
Yeah, so I added it, I guess. Survey plat means a map or plan drawn to scale of one or more parcels, tracts, or subdivisions of land, showing but not, not limited to boundaries, corners, markers, monuments, easements, and other rights. And I'm guessing I got this from the state because... Okay, so that's a new that's a new definition that we'll add. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. Then can we capitalize survey plat? Capital S, capital P. Yep. Yeah. So where we're does that get us to five point six point three? Yeah, I think the one thing we did add was right under E if five point six point two point two E above where it says the, the proposed change does not violate any conditions imposed by the Planning Commission or the Zoning Board of Adjustment from prior approvals. If that is not met, then the application shall be reviewed by the Planning Commission with notice and decision procedures as for subdivision review. So that would be a situation where it would, it would go to the Planning Commission. So it, is that then as for major subdivision review? Or? Well, it, no, because it's not, it might be a two lot, but it violates some, some condition that was placed on that property by a previous planning commission. That doesn't make it a, a major, re, major. Right, because it says from prior approvals. Right, okay. <laughs> Makes sense. So then we're down to minor, I think. I'm flipping the page. Did anyone have questions on any of the application requirements? Um, what's the, in one sub one C, a subdivision plan, site plan, and survey plat? So what should that I say? say? Do you have the current ones? The, uh, the current, the current. Current, yeah. What current that, ordinance. Current, you say. I have a marked one, so I can see what's new and what's not. We have um, in Article Seven. I don't see a definition for site plan. Maybe it's embedded in. I th I meant what did the current zoning regulations say? Oh. Oh well, we didn't have minor subdivisions, so never mind. They wouldn't have said anything. This is all brand um, new. Yeah. I think when you and I talked, we wanted to change it to survey. Well, it's survey plat. A subdivision plan and survey plat. And my comment was define, should it say site plan? Yeah, that was one we talked about and I don't think they resolved. So let's leave leave that as an open question so what's what's the difference between subdivision plan i mean i know i know what the the difference is between subdivision plan site plan and survey so if if you have a plan you should have a survey outlining the plan so can't that just be one one word that's instead of three different. 
Yeah, or, or are, are two of them different enough that we need both? Um, oh, I, I think I remember when we were talking. So, I mean, probably not for a minor one, but for a major one, you might have more aspects included than just a drawing of what's going to be there because especially for a major one you may want a homeowners association or something else where you're going to want more information than is just what's on the survey well plan. that's for a major right that would be a for a major so you may not need that for a minor a minor so could it read a subdivision plan with survey plat that shows all the detail required under section blah, blah, blah. And then, but what's the subdivision plan again? We just, we need to do, I guess we can get rid of site plan and define subdivision plan. I mean, do we need a definition of it or, we, or is it sufficient to say a subdivision plan describing whatever describing um, the relevant features of the parcels to be divided or something like that can it be as simple as that or does it have to be more robust for a minor subdivision right. i mean yeah i guess that's going to depend on are we going to try to eliminate it or try to define it so it's only relevant to the major subdivision or you know let me think about that yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, opposed to having, to someone's going to subdivide a big parcel and do two things with it. I'm not opposed to having a, a plan that says what they're doing. Right. Um, but you might want to have. Shouldn't that be defined in the application? It should be probably defined somewhere. Um, I mean, so what needs to be defined? Subdivision plan. What you put in the subdivision plan. What should someone have to put in their subdivision plan? For, for a minor subdivision, is it? Uh, right, but your, I mean, your application right now doesn't say attach a homeowners association, attach, you know, attract, attach whatever else, some forest management plan, or, you know, I don't know what might be, it would depend on the, on the particular subdivision. I mean, if it's a 30 lot subdivision and you're putting in tennis courts and, you know, I mean, I don't know, you don't know what it could be, so. So for mm -hmm. minor, where it's just two lots. Right, I mean, you may only, we maybe one? only, maybe you don't need a plan, maybe you just need the survey plan. Yes. I agree. And it could be a survey plat that shows all and get rid of the subdivision plan and site plan. Right. Yeah. Okay. That works for me. Jane, you go with that? Mm hmm. So if we have a survey plat, no need also for a site plan, right? Seems redundant, I think. Okay. My computer died, so. Oh, no. Um, oh, just battery. <laughs> so there are a lot of, there are a lot of little things that need doing, but the part that's yellow is a question, is a particular question, unless there are questions up above, about sort of a serial minor subdivider. Um, the lot or parcel to be subdivided was not created in the fill in the blank, 10 year period, five year period. Um, before, so if I have a big piece of land, I could minor subdivide it, create two parcels, wait X number of years, minor subdivide those two parcels, now I've got four parcels. It's sort of an end run around a major subdivision. Is that what the intent of that was? Yeah. So I think the question is, that, which seems, 
I think that makes sense. Uh, what's the right time period? Five years, 10 years, something else? Uh, Martha, maybe you know this off the top of your head. I can't remember, but the state does have language um, and it's more tax related than it is, I think, um, permission related, but you can sell and I, the number seems to stick in my head six. You can subdivide a parcel to, and, it, and it may be, <clears throat> now that I'm thinking about it, I think if you subdivide more than five parcels, it can trigger within a certain period of time, it can trigger Act 250. Right, depends whether you're a, um, a one acre town or a 10 acre town. Right. But yeah. So are you suggesting that whatever that time period is, we use that for this as well? I think it might be wise to align ourselves with that. And then it would make it clear for, for people well, the only, I guess the only challenge with that is this, this law that just passed this H687 is changing Act 250 enormously. So how do you in, even- In certain areas, not in all areas, if I'm understanding well, correctly. Yeah, I mean, it's basically gonna define villages and downtowns and you can, do things in those areas without an Act 250 permit, and then you go out a ways, and that's tier two, and that's kind of like it is now with Act 250. And then you get out into the boonies with a, you know, forest, no, for uh, connected forests or whatever, mm -hmm. and then they're going to actually have more Act 250 restrictions than there are now. So, but they're in the interim, there's these odd things that allow more development between now and whenever that goes into effect. So I don't know, it may be hard to try to align. I mean, I can look at it, but. Um... Let's, uh, let's table that one for now and try to poke around yeah. a little bit more and see if we can latch on to another time period that makes sense. Um, I think, I don't know if, I, I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm not even sure of my opinion on this one. I think five years is a, at a minimum what it should be. I could also get comfortable with 10 years, um, but let's see if we can peg it to something else in a way that makes sense. And it's only, it's not that you couldn't do it. It's just that it wouldn't be considered minor. A minor. Right. So you could subdivide it. You right. just couldn't, right. you couldn't sort of sneak it in right. this easy peasy way. Right. Right. Correct. Yeah. So I, my gut says 10 years, but let's see, let's see what the other one mm -hmm. says. Um, there's something above that also that I didn't see before because it wasn't yellow. Review standards, the ZA may grant a permit for a minor subdivision and you had commented with conditions if the ZA has a question about whether it meets it should it just go to the PC rather I than have conditions I think you had suggested putting in with conditions and generally I mean if anything is kind of iffy it goes to this to the board um, Generally, zoning administrators don't have a lot of discretion. All right. So, so, so the way it, the way it's reading right now is the way it should be. ZA may grant a permit if it meets the following standards: no conditions. Right. Okay. Um, were we going to put something in about the river corridor? We have this. Oh, we have it. We have it in there. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just looking. Yep. I see that. Mm -hmm. And you added the ridge line. Yeah. So the problem there, and uh, it's a question up in the air. Um, the map that is currently on Reading's website, as mm -hmm. the zoning map, does not have the ridge line district on it. 
There's, yeah. an, there's an overlay. Those maps? I think one of them was the ridge line overlay that I gave you. I did. There is the overlay, but what you're saying that it's not in the Reading zoning map. Right. So now can I asked we Jason and he said we did three maps for Reading and one of them has the overlay district on it. Well it's not the one that's on the website, so I don't know no. what do, that means. Do we need to update our website? I don't know. I don't know. I, there's a question about maps. Let's uh, <laughs> look and compare the two. There's okay. no ridge line overlay, right? Is that what you're saying? No, there is a ridge line overlay. There, there's, there's one. Right. There's not on the there, website. It's not on the map, on the official zoning map I that's see. on the website, or is okay. what is purported to be the official zoning map mm -hmm. on the website. So, so okay. are you saying that we would have to redo our zoning map, or could we just refer to both? So it's, there's nothing in the ridge line protection overlay district uh, as notated on the ridge line protection overlay map. Could we just refer to it and pull it in that way, or does it have to be on the official zoning map? Somewhere in these regulations, I think in everyone's regulations, it says the zoning map is, you know, the final authority on everything related to your zoning process. So then I don't even understand why this has to be in there because if the if the overlay exists and the ZA says yes you can subdivide but please be conscientious of the ridge line overlay because your parcel or the newly the newly partitioned parcel has a, a overlay on it you can't build or you have to get a, a conditional use permit. So if you're just doing bearing, a, bearing. you're just doing a minor subdivision with a two lot subdivision. And now one of those lots is going to be full in the ridge line protection. Are you saying that we don't care? It just then they have to just deal with the ridge line protection separately and whether or not that's a subdivision, it doesn't matter for the Z well, purposes. Technically, if you, it, okay, so let's say you have a parcel and half of it is in the ridge line overlay and half of it is not. And the new parcel that is in the ridge line overlay, you want to build a house there or, or a structure, then you would have to go get a variance to do so. No, this is just, uh, you, you'd have to go to the planning commission instead of having the zoning approve it. It would be so, if so theoretically if the ZA did a minor subdivision and it created two lots, one that wasn't in the ridge line overlay and one that was, if someone were to want to build on that lot that is in the ridge line overlay, then they would have to go to the PC to get a variance to build on that lot. So should we flag that for a potential subdivider by saying it's not going to be a minor subdivision, you have to go to the full PC, or do we let the ZA make that subdivision without any input from the PC? I guess that's the question, right? Yeah, right now these are saying if it's in the floodplain, the river corridor, the special wild, uh, this wildlife habitat, or the ridgeline protection overlay district, then that gets that that's a major by definition that's a major subdivision, and it goes to the planning commission rather than the zoning administrator. I guess I'm okay with that concept, mm -hmm. whether or not we have to have the actual overlay on our zoning map. I think you do. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, Can we find where it says that? Do we know where that is? Um, my computer died. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my battery died. Um, so I can't find it right now, but. Is originally defined strictly by the elevation? I don't know. It's usually. No, not necessarily. That's why you need the map. 
I mean, it is in your town plan maps, mm -hmm. but it's so small, and, you, mm -hmm. and there's no parcels, so you can't really tell what's in it and what's not. Right. The one I have is. Okay. And does that have parcels? Or? I don't know. I gave them to you. Right. Kevin okay. gave them to me. Mm -hmm. I thought, I thought original lines would have to be on a certain elevation and were not considered original. Well, I, I'd have to go back to the section of your bylaws and see what it says. If, you know, how, how that, I mean, there is a map, ridge line overlay in the town plan, and I haven't seen one other than that. But I don't know how you enforce your zoning regulations without a map showing where mm -hmm. that is. Um, so, well, that would be very me? helpful to have that overlay on a map. And it is on a map. It's just we need to merge the two together. And and Jason said he thinks that that exists. Yeah. So it let's, track, let's track that down. And Jane, you think you gave me maps that maybe have that? I know there's ridge line markings on a couple maps. Okay. So I don't know if that's the right thing, but all right, let's um let's check that out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the um under major subdivision, what we added was an amendment to a previously approved subdivision when we're defining what a major subdivision is. Three or more lots, a subdivision that doesn't meet the criteria for a lot line or minor subdivision, which would include the ones we were just talking about, and then an amendment to a previously approved subdivision. Okay. And then in addition to the information that you have to provide for a minor subdivision, you, there, you shall submit a written request for any waivers in accordance with the waiver section. Um, this is where B, I have a lot of questions. An application for a subdivision of land in or partially in the wildlife habitat district shall include a chart provided by the planning commission completed with the help of the planning commission that tracks parcel development to ensure the 25 acre minimum density condition is met now and in the future. Minimum um, or maximum? Maximum. Does this chart exist? Um, it, it seems like if it does exist, you, if you're going to have the planning commission help you complete it, you couldn't submit it in advance as part of your application requirement. Where is this coming from? Was this the this is prior in there planning? Now. This is in there now. That's in there now? Yeah. And I didn't know, has it ever come up? Is there any such chart? Who has it? Does anyone know? The application <laughs> requirements, all that red is currently in our... It's currently in your... Yes. Yeah. So I do not have any chart. Have either of you ever seen this chart? I have. Red? This chart? Well, maybe that's a little research project. I will look at what I have at home. So the issue is keeping, so when, when subdivisions are made in the wildlife area, it's keeping track of how they're being made so that they match all those little um, sketches for how to properly sub subdivide in the wildlife area. Is that it? Right. And so, you know, then come in and do another one. Messing up your little parcel cluster. That was when it was already done, because once you've done one, apparently, I think that's it. You're not supposed to subdivide any further. Is there any way to do it besides the PC keeping a chart? Could it be? That's why I was thinking. It... Could you put it on they have to file a survey plat, right? Could you put the requirement to be put on the survey plat? This is in a wildlife area, you know, and it can't be, can, you, can we stamp it, it on the plat? It seems like it should be somewhere other than attached to the application because 
when you're filling out the application, you're not even going to know, you don't know yet. what this chart is all about. So <laughs> at a minimum, I would think that you'd need the Planning Commission's assistance in doing whatever it is that needs to be done. And maybe that needs to be clarified. Um, is the, would that not fall under like the wildlife, the state regulations? Uh, I think they it last year, as a matter of fact, for I think they changed a couple of areas that were considered or they moved them or something. It seems to me up on, up on the hill up there. Because Hall uh, sold part of a property to the wildlife corridor. So it's back up, like by Nat Pond up or, or right. yeah. Yeah. So they changed. Yeah. So that is part of it up there. Yeah. And I think part of it had changed last year. Mm -hmm. But for your purposes, you you have a zoning I, district. I don't have a map or right. Yeah. I just mm -hmm. recall seeing it. Yeah. It. There, there is a section though that sketches out how you're supposed to subdivide in the wildlife area. Where is that? I know I've seen so it, 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 there is a paragraph in 5.6.2.3, it mentions forest and significant wildlife habitat, and then it goes to 3B, it says where development of forest threatens significant wildlife habitat and other biologically sensitive areas, building sites shall be located to the periphery in order to avoid undue fragmentation of those forests. I don't see any of this other language, Martha. And it says subdivision within a significant wildlife habitat overlay district shall, this is D as in David, in addition comply with the standards in the significant wildlife habitat overlay district section 2.4.9. There's something about a chart. You don't see anything about a chart. Mm -mm. Nothing about it. No. In the in your existing regs. Mm -mm. No. Well, I'm gonna have to look at that. Unless I'm missing it, but I I'm looking at all of that section right now, and I don't see anything about a chart. So I am wondering if the uh, in the process of this these revisions, if that's something that came out of the prior commission. Did you tell me that by any chance? No. I, I know I read this when I read your zoning regulation and I'm like, huh? <laughs> so it's not something I added. <laughs> um, It does say in subdivisions to five, to be five, um, Vermont and federal permits required of the proposed subdivision shall submit all necessary municipal permits or a letter of intent for a Vermont access permit to complete an application a complete application so also it should shall also include a Vermont Agency of Natural Resources project review sheet, but that would come from that agency. It wouldn't come from the PC. Yeah, I'll have to look at that. Um, what I have in front of me is the proposed regulations and my battery died, so I can't go back and look at um, where that came from. And I feel like I've seen somewhere, I'm not finding it right now, um, a s little sketches of what it should look like versus what it should it's, look yeah, like. It's in there. Yep. That's in there. I think it's like at the end of the, you've got your zoning sections and yeah. then mm -hmm. right after that. Oh, you have back here. Right, sections. right, right, right. Back here. Like in a, in a, in a pet? Oh, hold on. Like it's as a point five or two point. Two. Here's the ridge line. Oh, and this is part of found. zoning. It's because it's two point four point nine. Two point four point nine. That's a little chart. I think this is 
sleeping on the website. Has the little pictures. So 2.4.9 is two, three pages of the significant wildlife. And so this must be the three that Jason was talking about, mm -hmm. but only one of them is on the website. Mm -hmm. So. So we have to get this on the website, correct? All three. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So, so section two point four point nine is talking about the wildlife areas, and it's a perfect example of when you just get a section and drop it into your code without referencing it, how it gets lost. Um, so it has something here that says. Uh, 2.4.9, there's one, and it talks about how you break it up. So rather than just four equal parcels, maybe you make a big area and then little parcels and then little pictures, and then it says two subdivisions. Subdivisions between the, uh, within the wildlife area, including corridors and deer wintering, shall comply with the following standards. And then it has four different standards. But that's not even being referenced in our subdivision section. Right? Well, just yeah. by name, you know, significant wildlife habitat overlay district. But it should maybe it should say C section, blah, blah, blah. I think it should yeah. because that's how it gets forgotten, both by the ZA or by the PC or the ZBA, yeah. where we kind of tuck it in and then we never find it again. Yeah. Is it time to go? Oh, it's 2107. Oh. Okay, well, that feels like a big win right there. Um, so I think we need to tie in the subdivision section to the requirements for the wildlife since they're already there. They're just dropped in without any cross referencing. And then see how it looks again when we come back. I thought I was going crazy. I knew I'd seen those little sketches somewhere. <clears throat> All right, so we'll start next time with the major subdivision and um, I'll try and find this chart thing where it's referred to. Sounds good. Sorry, I lost track of the time. That was so exciting. <laughs> I lost all sense of um, timing. Let's see, how are we doing on our, I've also lost my agenda. We, uh, Next, we meeting. On there. Next meeting. Next meeting. Next meeting, yeah. Next meeting will be um, July, Tuesday, July, July 30th. 30th. Yep. Might as well just stay here. Any, any comments from the board? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Um, anything else on that agenda? Other business? Other so other business, I, I just have one quick question. Have we received any further documentation or correspondence regarding the continuance next week? Not as of now, no. It's been so I don't know if I was, what's that? It was, it was warned again and letters were sent out. You got a letter? Mm -hmm. And it's been posted, that's as of two weeks ago in the Vermont Center, but nobody responded yet. As an okay. And then my next question related to that is in the select board meeting when um, the state was there, a VTRAN maybe, the guy was there speaking about the bridge and he said he was going to provide all of us with a study uh, about potentially impacted parcels surrounding the bridge and did we ever receive anything from them? He did? No, no, but he did say that. Yeah. No. That sounds familiar. He did say that, right, Shanann? I... Yes. yes, I remember oh, that. Good. Okay. So I, I haven't seen anything and I haven't heard of anything. Yeah. Okay. Me neither. Okay, that's all I have. Okay. Um, anything else on the agenda? I've shuffled mine away. 
Oh, here it is. Perfect. I'm going to be adjourned. Okay. As a motion. I second. I second. We all agree. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night.